And presumably somebody has introduced me, if not, I'm Christopher Moore. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk about my new book, which is not in here. Um, it's called Shakespeare for Squirrels. And you say, why would you do that? I have no idea what my audience is like here. Um, so, so hopefully you're here on purpose and you don't go, why is this crazed old man talking about teaching Shakespeare to squirrels? I'm glad you asked. Um, I wrote a book uh, about 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, called Fool. And that starred a, a character called Pocket, who was King Lear's um, jester, his fool. And that worked out really well, and it was pretty funny, and um, it vastly improved Shakespeare's play. So a few years later, I wrote a book called The Serpent of Venice, which took the plays of Merchant of Venice and Othello and sort of wrapped them into uh, um, the Casco Montiato by Edgar Allan Poe and told a monster story set in Venice in the um, late 13th century. So that brings me to this one. Now this one is my fool pocket, who's this diminutive guy, sort of the dimensions you might think of as a, as a jockey um, and his giant sort of dim-witted uh, apprentice drool. Um, and they wash up on the shores of a very mythical Greece and sort of in, impose themselves into the, uh, into the plot of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, A Midsummer Night's Dream is, unlike the other places, there's no historical base for it at all. The Athens that, that appears in a, in a Midsummer Night's Dream is, uh, there's no historical analog for it. And there's not even a way that I could shift the time where, like I did in uh, Merchant of Venice, where that was set in the 16th century and I set it in the 13th century. Um, so I was sort of open to be able to do what I, what I wanted, which is one of the reasons that Midsummer Night's Dream gets produced more than any other Shakespeare play, because once you get to the fairy wood, once you get to the part that is the Midsummer Night's Dream, it can be set anywhere. I've seen, uh, I've seen glam rock versions, two of those. I've seen... Uh, punk versions. I've seen uh, the fairy wood supposed to be a dump and the fairies are all wearing bin bags as costumes. And I think it's, it, you know, aside from all the magic and the, and the sort of goofy Three's Company plot of, of the lovers in Midsummer Night's Dream, it just lends itself to a lot of visual puns and, and fun stuff. And um, so initially I was going to set the fairy wood in 1947 San Francisco so that Pocket, my basically medieval fool, would have to deal with all these guys and dolls, gangster types um, in San Francisco post-war. And I researched that quite a bit. And I set the proposal in um, for a new contract. And, and uh, in like nearly 30 years of doing this, I've never had to change what I was gonna approach in a book because of, to demand. You hear that about screenwriters all the time where they come in and they say, oh, I wanna do a movie about uh, the Spartans and Thermopylae uh, fighting the Persians and, and the producer goes, well, that would be great, but can you set it in Santa Monica in the 1980s and they're all Coke dealers? And um, I've never dealt with that. I, screenwriters do that all the time and they're usually pretty quick on their feet. I am not. And so uh, my agent called me to congratulate me on the new contract and he said, but they don't want the Shakespeare book next. And within seconds, my editor called and said, oh, we're going to be doing more books together. It's going to be great. And I said, yeah, but I heard you don't want the Shakespeare book next. And she said, yeah, not next. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And she kind of said, you know, a, a much more intellectual version of what do you got? And I was at a loss. I had never had to come up with anything on the spur of the moment. And I said, you know, initially I could do another whale book because I did this whale book about, you know, 2002 um, called Fluke. And it was a lot of fun to research. And I thought I'll do another one of those. But New Yorkers are uncomfortable with whales because they're outdoors. And, um, and so she was like, nah. And um, I said, well, I could, I thought about all the research I had done about San Francisco in post-war and, and all the gangster types and, and the vernacular they use. And I, I said, well, I could do kind of a Maltese falcony kind of thing set in San Francisco. And she said, yeah, do that. And I said, do what? She said, the Maltese falcony kind of thing. And I said, not the 10 page proposal detailed on what I was going to do with the Shakespeare book, you want a book based on a Maltese Falcony kind of thing. And she said, yeah. And I've done a lot of books with my editor. I've done like 11 books with her. And, and she's a lovely woman, but I, I felt hosed on that one. But I was like, okay, I ran off and I wrote um, 
a book that came out a couple of years ago called Noir, which is guys and dolls and set in San Francisco in the 1940s. And um, so when I came to do this one, I didn't really have that to fall back on. I couldn't do two books with completely different sets of characters and different plots um, and, and add that time travel thing. So I just sort of had to go straight into um, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was it was a pretty high bar for me, even though it's a, a fairly straightforward and silly plot. Um, it was uh, it was tough to not have that time travel aspect because of the time we live in. I'm sort of classified an absurdist humorist, and the bar on absurd has gotten raised a lot in the last three and a half years. Um, as you know, as soon as you say, "Oh, you know what would be really absurd and it's to blow people away," is I want to do. A, a whale and they see bite me spray painted across its flukes when it dives and then somebody sort of turns and says yeah the president said we should all drink bleach yesterday and i'm like fuck me i don't know what to do now um so so this was a difficult book to write and it shouldn't have been but it was just simply because i didn't know what could you know what i could do to comment on the human condition as it is right now which is we're all locked in our houses because of a plague it's the human condition right now um and, uh, and, and so I sort of just went straight forward with the fairy tale aspect of it. And I was writing at, uh, at a condo I have on the Russian River. And it's on the third floor of this building that's very sort of uh, craftsman style, shingle looking, blends into the woods kind of thing. And um, all day long, I'm there by myself and squirrels are coming out on the deck and meeting. So I, as it turned out, the squirrels sort of imposed themselves into... Uh, into the book, and that's how we ended up with the with the title Shakespeare for Squirrels. It's uh, it also sort of riffs on my first book was called Practical Demon Keeping, which I wrote in 1990. It came out in, or finished it in 1990. It came out in 1992, and uh, and that was just it sounded sort of like an instructional. All I wanted to do is if you were walking through the book bookstore and you saw it, you would pick it up because people used to walk through bookstores. And they used to pick up books. And then if you had an interesting cover or a title, they might go, oh, I'll look at that. And I thought, well, that's how I found A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I didn't really plan on hitchhiking in the galaxy. I just thought, what is this? And so that's what I do with Practical Demon Kick. And I thought, well, after you know, 16 novels, maybe I should sort of return to that fake how-to thing. So Shakespeare for Squirrels was born. And um, it, uh, wow, this was supposed to be 20 minutes long, but I'm very nervous because none of the sound worked right before we signed on. And, and so I've spoken much more quickly than I have in the past. So anyway, let's go to Q&A. You guys can ask questions. They'll put them up on the screen for me. I'll answer them back. I don't know if I'm supposed to credit you. Maybe they'll give me instructions. And, um, and I'll talk about this book or any book. If you're just tuning in and you've always wanted to ask me, why did you write Lamb? You ruined my faith. Or, or uh, you know, tell me your, your mom's a whore. Um, any of that's fine. Um, although, you know, my mom's dead, so I don't care what you say about her. Um, this book, uh, the question is, how did, how did I go about my research for this novel? I don't know if you guys are seeing this or not. Um, this book didn't really require that much research because, as I said, when I started looking for the historical background on it, which existed for the other Shakespeare books I did, I, even if I had to arbitrarily choose what time period, um, there was nothing. Hippolyta and, um, and uh, what's the character's name? Theseus, I think. Uh, they're from Greek mythology, and those are the... the the duke and the queen in, in the play. Titania and Oberon, the king and queen of the fairies, didn't really exist until Shakespeare mentioned them. You know, now there's two moons of uh, Saturn, let's say, um, named after them. Maybe Uranus? Yes, the king and queen of the fairies are right now, I'm not even going to tell that joke. Um, anyway, so there wasn't that much research for it. Um, it was just simply going back to the play, seeing what I could use, trying not to confuse the characters. When you when Shakespeare wrote plays, he was writing them from a troop of actors. So if you had two characters whose names started with uh, the same letter, you weren't going to confuse them because one might be a really tall guy and, and one might be a, a really short guy or whatever and, and get different costumes. But, you know, as first day at famous novelist school, they teach you don't have major characters whose letters start with the same name because people will read be reading really fast and you tend to only see about 30 percent of what you're reading and your mind fills in the rest and they're going to see for instance in midsummer and extreme helena and uh, and hermia which are the two girls who are thrown out into the woods in the 
um, the Shakespeare's uh, prerequisite daughter's threatened with death if she doesn't marry the right guy plot, which is in like a lot of the plays. He definitely had father-daughter problems. Um, but anyway, they both have, their names start with H-E, and it, and it would be uh, confused. And, and Lysander and Demetrius, who are the male interests in that little uh, story, um, they're interchangeable personality-wise. Um, I had to change, and I gave them different personalities so that you know who to look for and against. But anyway, there wasn't that much research to do for it. It was just basically adhering to the play where I could and then diver diverting from the play where I didn't have to. Um, quite frankly and honestly, I should have been able to write it a lot faster. Um, question is, is there an influence that I can speak to of my use of Drool and characters like him in Lamb? Um, Drool is a great beef-brained boy. Pocket calls him all the time. And, and uh, he's, a, he's a large ninny. And in, um, in Lamb, there's a large beef brain ninny um, who is the town um, the town fool, the, the village idiot. And he's, his name's Balthasar. He ends up being one of the apostles in, in Lamb. And um, they come from different, uh, they're very similar characters, so good eye there. But they come from different inspirations. Balthasar comes from Dionysus. When I was researching Lamb, which did, it was probably my second biggest research project, um, I found contemporary to Jesus uh, was the Greek philosopher Dionysus. And um, his, uh, his followers are called the skeptics. And, and basically, there's a point in Gospels, and I don't remember at this point because it's been 20 years, where Jesus says, you know, kick the dust off your souls. Go, don't even take a bowl with you. Just go, you know, go out with nothing and, and preach the gospel. And, and Dionysus told the same thing to his followers. And, and that book was all about trying to uh, draw parallels of the different kinds of thought that were going on in the world in the first century, uh, in the first century. So, so Balthazar, the village idiot, is sort of, he lives among the dogs, but he's philosophical about it. He's got a, he's got a base. He's not just like really like dog food or whatever. Um, and so that's what, and it's always fun to have a, a big dumb guy as a, as a um, drool is really the revenge of, um, of Lenny from, uh, uh, from Of Mice and Men. Um, Steinbeck was a big influence on me and I, I was put off of Steinbeck for like 10 years because in high school uh, we had to read Of Mice and Men. I think we probably still do. And you go, oh, this is an amusing story about a great big guy and a little sharp guy. And, and um, oh, good, the little guy blows the big guy's brains out at the end. And I was like, no, I don't, that doesn't seem right to me. So um, I didn't read Steinbeck for like 10 years. And finally, a friend said, you've got to read Cannery Row. And it kind of changed my whole outlook on how I write um, because of the voice in it being so sort of sweet and, and forgiving. And uh, I, I needed that in my humor. And, and um so, so drool is sort of the revenge of Lenny from *Up Mice and Men*. Drool, in in *Fool* in particular, he's not just the big dumb guy. He's the big dumb guy who gets all the girls um, for various reasons. So they don't know it at the time. It's 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 definitely a. Uh, they definitely take advantage of of the evil princesses in that in that book, but. Um, so the two characters are very much alike, but they came from just different inspirations. One being from the Dionysian um, uh, philosophical uh, teachings, and the, and drool from of mice and men. So, hope that answers your question. Which of my books resonates with me most? Um, depends on on what day it is. Honestly, it's it's usually the one that I'm working on at the time because that's where your head has to, you have to kind of be in it 100%. Um, I have different, uh, you know, this is, these are books I've written over a 30 year career. So I've changed as a human being. If you, if you know, you look at the auto, the characters that are autobiographical, um, it's Tommy Flood in Blood Sucking Fiends and then You Suck and Bite Me. And Tommy's 19 years old in, um, in the first book. Well, that was a lot like what I was like when I was 19. I worked in a grocery store at night and most of the stuff that the animals do in the, in the grocery store in that book, um, we did, except for hunting vampires. And um, 
and and so that reflects who I was at that time. So does it resonate with me now? Not only as only in memory, um, and I tend to like to write uh, characters that are around their mid twenties to mid thirties, just because I think that's a an important time in a person's life when they're when they gel as a human being, and yet they don't completely have it figured out. And I like to put people in a position where they're uh, in uncomfortable uh, situations that they have to solve. You know, that's sort of my, uh, I don't know, wouldn't call it a formula, but I find it's an interesting way to make conflict is to take some normal person, man or woman, and just throw some weird shit at them. Um, so, so those books resonate with me in that they, uh, they represent who I was at the time that character is, but it's sort of stuck um, in a, in an age 30 for that aspect of it. For interest, they interest me in what, you know, um, Sacre Bleu, I was, I really liked looking at art and, and uh, studying art and I learned to paint a little for Sacre Bleu and it was a huge research project, but it was glorious. It was one of the best times of my life, just going to Paris and looking at art and, and over the years having gone all over the country on book tour and in the afternoons going to all the different uh, art museums in the different American cities. So. Um, that one, I, I, it has a special part, uh, special place in my heart because it, I feel like there's nothing like that that anybody else has ever done. And I think that my other books, it's sort of like, oh, this is sort of a version of that, or this is sort of a version of that. Sacre Bleu, I don't, I don't know of any other book that's like that, that's, that's completely based in, in visual art and, and tells the story of the kind of character that Blue is. And uh, so that one has a, that has a special meaning to me. And then, you know, Lamb because it bought me a house. Um, so, anyway, hope that answers your question. Um, sorry, my computer's asking me something. What's my writing process like, and do I have any rituals or favorite workspaces? Um, yeah, I do. I have, uh, I usually have some sort of talisman. So, this is a great time to ask me. So, when I'm writing the Shakespeare books, I always have like this guy this guy around and they just are like on my desk reminding me I have some responsibility to to work with the bard's work um, and it, and for some books it might be a dragon or a plastic whale I don't have all my toys um, I, somebody moved my uh, my other ones that I had with my last uh, presentation anyway um, so I have that I have some sort of talisman that I keep on my desk when I'm working uh, rituals I, I just try to wake up in the book I try to get up make coffee sit down on my desk and and start working and it might mean that I sit there for an hour before I come up with anything but but it's very much when I'm working on a book I try to work every day um, and the reason I do that is um, because I tried everything else and I wasted a decade basically trying to you know do it on Sunday night before it's due on Monday like to do term papers and uh, in every other aspect you know trying waiting to find inspiration or doing things that are completely uh, oblique to getting work done. You know, I would have a guy, I wrote my first book in a diner and I wrote it by hand because that was, I didn't have a computer. And, uh, and there was another guy who was writing a book and he would come up and he goes, you know, one thing that really helps me is to smoke weed and go walking on the beach. And he was like, okay, but I know that I've written a couple hundred pages and you're still like in the first six or seven pages. So while you may be inspired, I didn't say any of this. I was, I would have been mean. But the point was, it just I I had tried stuff like that and it didn't work. I had tried uh, in my mid twenties. I think the tradition of like, well, F. Scott Fitzgerald was a drunk and that worked for him, and Faulkner was drunk and that worked for him. I should be a drunk too because that's what it takes to be a great writer. It turns out, no, it does not. Um, so basically, it's it's a it's a discipline that I try to get into the book and I try to wake up in the book. And then it's usually the last thing I think about before I go to sleep at night, you know. And, and if you keep uh, beating your head against problems, then you'll solve them. That's, that's how you get over being stuck, which is usually the next question. Um, when I was swimming for, when I lived in Hawaii, we had a swimming pool, um, a lap pool. And when I was swimming laps, since you can't like listen to music, at that point you couldn't listen to music or you know, watch anything, um, I would just take whatever plot problem I had and just think about it the whole time I was swimming and then I had a, a pad of waterproof paper and, and pen at the end of the pool so if I could just hold the thought until I got to the end of the pool I could write it down, draw my hands up and write it down so 
the ritual for me is just trying to trying to work every day when I'm on a book. Anybody have a question? Who are some of my favorite authors? Probably who you'd think. Um, uh, the, the most, I think the, the one that's not obvious is John Steinbeck. And again, because of the, his voice was awesome. Um, and, he, and he wrote about four comic novels that are, that are quite funny. Uh, Canary Rose, Sweet Thursday, uh, Tortilla Flat, um, and, the, and Pippin the Fourth, uh, the short reign of, of Pippin the Fourth. And, uh, and they're, they're, quite, they're quite funny, and a few of his short stories are. So that, those, that touched me. Uh, Steinbeck, Mark Twain, um, uh, trying to think. Carson McCullers, I like uh, Ballad of the Sad Cafe and Member of the Wedding. And um, uh, more contemporary. And, and you know, I, just doing my homework as somebody who writes humor, you know, I've read Wodehouse and um, all, the, all the Brits, basically, and you're going back to Jonathan Swift. Was he a Brit or Irish? Anyway, I read him. I don't know what his biography was. Um, and uh, contemporary Carl Hyacin, I like. Um, uh, I, there's a British author I like uh, named uh, Millington, who, who wrote, uh, his first book was called Things My Girlfriend and I Have Argued About. And if you Google that, there's a whole website of stuff that he did for The Guardian that's free and it's quite funny. Um, I like David Sedaris and Dave Barry and you know, guys that just write humor, humorous essays. Uh, Jane Voss and stuff is funny. Um, there's not, since Elmore Leonard died, there's nobody that I'm really waiting for their next novel to come out. Um, and Elmore Leonard, I, I sort of religiously read everything that he wrote. Um, and because he, he had that great skill of not writing the stuff that you, that you skipped, and he said that, you know. And I, when I was writing my first book, I thought, I'm not going to write the stuff you skipped either. So. Um, those are, those are, I think, enough to, to get you started. But those, those are a, a pretty good list of my favorites. Um, is there a master timeline web that I use to keep track of all the character cameos and crossovers or just wing it and let it continue? The ones from book to book, I assume, is what that question means. Um, I don't keep track of them. And, then it, and it drives uh, my agents nuts because... Um, when you're dealing with film rights, they want to know, oh, we bought this book. And you go, yeah, well, you know, that one character is, he walks through this other book. I don't keep track of them. I've had to come up with a sort of flow chart to show to film companies and stuff who are interested in my work. Um, and when I'm working on a book, I keep, uh, I have a big sketch pad, big sketch pad. And I sort of do circles and arrows of the plot and I, and I plot visually. But as far as um, when a character shows up from another book it's usually by requests because my readers have been sending me emails saying i want to see more of roberta the fruit bat or of whatever character it is and i don't want to write another book about micronesia so i just put roberta the fruit bat in california at christmas time and try and figure that out um or i just think well that would be cool that would be a cool thing to happen and uh, because i like that I, stephen king would do that he'd have little bits flowing from one book to another. And he was smart enough, I think, to not actually have repeat characters in most of them. Um, but uh, um, so if they're just like Easter eggs, you know, um, Kona from Fluke, who is just this sort of surfer dude, Trustafarian, um, who lives on um, Maui. He shows up as a boat captain in, in Bite Me, my vampire book. And it's clearly the same guy. He talks the same way. He looks the same way. Um, and I thought that would cool. I thought my readers will go, this is your payback for having stuck with my stupid shit all these years. So, uh, but I don't charge. I should, but, and I, I've really tried to not do that in the last couple of books because it's caused so many problems with scaring away uh, rights people in Hollywood. So, anyway, that answers your question. Are there characters I want to return to at some point? I would, I would write another pocketbook. I like, I'm writing a, book with the characters from noir now. Um, I really liked those characters. Um, they're fun to write. They're fun. Uh, they talk, the way they talk is crafted. You have to, every line they say, you have to figure out how they're going to say it. The kid from noir who's, who's never named as anything but the kid and he's horrible. He's a horrible little kid. Um, he's fun, really fun to write. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to revisit those. Other characters, there's some that I would I wouldn't mind revisiting, but I just don't think that it would be a good idea. I don't think it would be a good idea to do a sequel to Lamb because you guys would go, oh, it's good, but it's not Lamb, and I, there's no reason to set myself up for that. 
and you know because that book I think it does what it's supposed to do um, and the same with the sac the characters in Sacre Bleu, um and the characters in Fluke all of them I, I could definitely write more about them um, particularly Fluke because those characters a number of them were based on real people who I became very good friends with and still you know spend Christmases with and stuff and it's like yeah I'd love to write more about those guys but um, um, nobody that I have planned other than the noir book that, that I'm working on right now I don't have a title for it yet. what book made me want to be a writer um, I think the easiest thing to answer that is is what the book that made me um, realize that a writer was there I was always a voracious reader from a little kid I was an only child my dad read a book a day he was a cop and he and on his day off, he would go and get, you know, a big stack of suspense novels, you know, the, the Tom Clancy of the time, Alistair McLean and Ian Fleming and stuff like that. And he always brought me books. So I read a lot. And and I, I didn't really think about the idea of crafting. I and mean, I was reading um, Ray Bradbury's R is for Rocket when I was in fifth grade. And because they're short stories, the craft is right out there. And if you those of you who have written short stories know that, that it's no spare words everything is is going to be you can see it happening in front of you and, and you it's so immediate that when you finish it you go oh that's what happened that was the effect that the author had and so i think that ours for rocket and the nest is for space and then the illustrated man all made me aware that there was a consciousness there there was somebody who was sort of manipulating me as a reader and and working a craft that made me think in certain ways and see things in certain ways and I think it was at that point, so it would have been about 11 that I went, oh, yeah, I, I'd like to do this. And I, and I sort of tried to do it a little bit um, early on. I mean, I can remember writing stories for class in sixth grade that were not that different than what I do now for a living, which was to rewrite. Uh, I remember rewriting uh, Icarus, um, the Daedalus and Icarus myth when I was in like fifth grade and rewriting Norse mythology when I was in sixth grade. Um, so so basically i've continued to do that i have not grown since sixth grade um but uh but i would say ray bradbury was the person who made me aware that this was something that you could do and it was a craft you could learn and i thought i wanted to do it so. what kind of advice do i give my fans many of which are aspiring writers well it's a different advice i mean that's a i i don't give any advice unless you're asking. Um, and, and my advice is obvious, I think. I'm not gonna, I, I wish I could give you like a magic wand that would make it easier, but it's not. It's, I've been doing this professionally for 30 years. I've been writing for 50 years. Um, and uh, it never, it's, it's still hard. It's hard every day. It's not horrible, it's great. I mean, I don't wanna make it sound, I'm not, I'm not digging ditches here. It's a great fucking job. Um, but, uh, but it's not easy, it's, and, and um, so you, you can't expect that. And, and uh, but you know, not to worry about that. Read a lot. You know, that's the thing: is get the language of your craft in your head. So it's the more of it that's automatic, the better. You know, now that I've I've written seventeen books and whatever else in between, so that when I'm writing a book, there's a lot of what I do that's tacit, that just is muscle memory of of writing, and and that's just when you start out you don't have that because you haven't solved that many problems but you do have the catalog of everything you've read and if you can remember that if you think oh well i remember what mark twain did in tom sawyer and he's how he solved that problem and i can remember and i may not do that same thing but i can look at how he did it or um how carson mccullers handled a awkward love affair in um, the Ballad of the Sad Cafe and, and how she solved that problem or presented that problem. And so I can, that can inform what I'm doing. And I've always done that. And, and to make the, that, that much more obvious, those of you who have read Lamb, the whole part when they're going to circumcise the statue um, in, in Sepphoris, is that the name of the town? I can't even remember that. Anyway, when they, when they're sort of, when they witness the murder of a, of a, uh, Roman legionary, that's completely this plot of Tom Sawyer, where Tom and Huck witness uh, Injun Joe murdering somebody, and then they have to go on the lamb to hide from someone who's going to hunt them down because they're witnesses to a murder. And that's, uh, that was completely intentional, and I have no problem if anybody recognizes it. But I probably read Tom Sawyer for the first time when I was like 12. 
and and there I was writing Lamb, you know, um, and and wiping that that plot. But but it was more saying, well, how how do you present two friends having an adventure? And that was like you know, there was Bill and Ted and Butch and Sundance and and Huck and Tom. And so I picked Huck and Tom for that one. Um, and so read a lot is is the best advice I can give you, and sort of see if you can get uh, the language of storytelling. Uh, by osmosis as much as you can and then as you get better and you start writing you'll start seeing stuff you'll start seeing that oh wow that wasn't by accident i i don't do that as much now but i can even when i start was writing for a living i would read something by f scott fitzgerald and i'd go oh my god he didn't do that by accident whereas a more naive younger writer would have just gone oh yeah if he just lucked out on that or, or not even seen the effect at all but um as you get better you see the craft and other writers have and, and admire it or and you can learn from bad writing too. You know, you can learn what not to do. I, when I was writing my first book, I was reading a novel by Judith Krantz that I kept on my bedside table. And whenever I would get discouraged because, oh my God, I'm never going to break in and I'm going to be waiting tables forever. Um, not a horrible job, by the way, but not something I wanted to do forever. Um, I would just pick up and read a couple of pages of Judith Krantz. And I'd go, oh, well, fuck, I can do better than this. Um, and she was like, so I think on the cover of is like 160 million in print and i'm like oh, i would take far less than that and be okay with it so so read a lot that's my first thing and then write you know if you're not if you don't want to write you either write or you don't write so that's my aspiring writer advice is there a minty fresh action figure no but there should be there should be um i don't know we'll have to we'll have to get it on We'll have to get Minty on TV or in a movie or something, and then somebody will make an action figure of him. A really tall action figure. Why do I think books are just what we need during this challenging time in quarantine? I don't know if that. We need funny books. I mean, I'm so glad I write funny books, and I totally understand people have been sending me notes on, on uh, Twitter and, and other social media about, you know, I'm so looking forward to your book because I need it. And I realize it's not because I'm brilliant although um it's because we need something funny we need something to bring us out i mean that the book fool started largely because i was only i only felt like i was getting information from comedians and everybody else was lying to me you know, it's like john stewart was coming on every night and was saying what was going on and the administration was corrupt and everybody else was lying about everything and, um and and i needed that and i figured other people needed that too so i wrote this book about a fool who speaks truth to power the least powerful person and I think that's what I need right now. I mean, I, my wife and I have a thing, and no matter what we're watching, what bizarre Scandinavian murder mystery we're watching, which turned out we do watch a lot of that. Um, uh, it has to, we had to end on comedy. You know, the night has got to, I'm, I'm not going to go to bed watching Scandinavian murder porn. It's going to be, you know, Shit's Creek or something like that. And so always constantly in search and I think books are the same way it's really hard to keep your head into something that's supposed to be I don't know suspense or scaring you when in fact there's a deadly disease and everybody's wearing a fucking mask you know uh, it, it, it the bar got raised on suspense I think too um, and boredom and, and so what what I'm hoping that a book does is transport me um, I, I wish I was reading something now that did that so I could give somebody else a, a big attaboy, but um, I hope that's what my books do. That's what we need. That's what I need is something that will distract me and doesn't require an enormous amount of, um, what am I thinking? Uh, it doesn't require me to, to backtrack on the plot a lot. You know, if you can read some of these pretty uh, intricately plotted suspense novels, and it's sort of like, what? And then you put it down for a day and you come back and you go, who is this person? And what, what? I forget. You know, which is the nice thing about real books. I like I can go, oh, well, I remember about an inch and a half back this guy told his story, but I can't do that with an e-book, but e-books are awesome. I just like the physical book. Better. So that's what we, we need, funny books. If I have real folks in mind when creating characters, either as personalities or physically. Sometimes I do have, um, sometimes I'll just see someone. Um, I was in San Francisco in, in like 93 researching uh, Blood, Sick, and Fiends. And by research, I mean, I was just, wanted to get the sights and, and sounds of the city and, and be able to put moments in there that seemed real. And I was on a bus, uh, the loop bus at that time was the 42 bus. And 
I saw this woman with this extraordinary cape of red hair, this curly red hair, and it was like she was probably five five, and it was half of her body length, and you know, um, all the way around. And I just thought that's like got to be like a full time job, and and it was, but it was so distinct. I was in the back of the bus, and this woman was standing by the bus driver, and and it was just out of thirty people that were on the bus, it was this very distinct person. And I thought, well, that's a feature that if I'm going to have a character sort of walk through the twilight part of the city oh my god she's ruined that word um but anyway if if, uh, if someone was going to run through the dark part of the city something very distinct that's what everybody would remember so just seeing that physical feature maybe want to have jody who becomes the heroine of those three books um have hair like that so sometimes yeah there's physical things um and then other times i'll, I'll frankenstein characters together theo crow is uh physically based on a guy that I worked at the radio station with. He's extraordinarily tall, sort of an Ichabod Crane kind of guy, and, and a little bit angsty about being an artist, because he, I think he describes him as saying he had the soul of artist, the artist, but none of the talent, which reflected somebody I knew. And um, and he was addicted to pot, which everybody said didn't happen at that time, but my girlfriend, from about the time I wrote that book, her brother was so addicted to pot that when he would quit smoking weed, he would go into cold sweats and have to change the sheets three times a night when he was trying to sleep. And so uh, I have Theo addicted to, to weed. And um, and it becomes, you know, weed used to be um, children. Weed used to be illegal. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so yeah, I use real people uh, to base it on. And as I said earlier, uh, two of the characters in Fluke are, are pulled right out of my experience with whale researchers. They're very thinly veiled. I mean, I give them different agendas because I had a plot. I needed one of them to be single who was married, and I, um, I need one of them to swear who doesn't. Um, but uh, but those guys are real people that I became friends with, and, and they're they're very thinly veiled. They're people who know them, other researchers who I've met over the years since then, go, oh, well, that's this guy, that's this guy. I go, yeah, it is. Um, so yeah, I do I do all the time. I mean, but most of the time, I'm trying to to take features from different people and build a, a character that will do what I need them to do out of them. So, whoop. Sort of my mad doc, I think. Have another question? Um, somebody's asking me, I uh, love noir, am I writing anything similar? I'm writing a sequel to noir like, right now. Um, it's going to end up with uh, Sammy Tutos trying to solve a murder. And then there's going to be weird shit because it's my book and that's what i do but i'm yeah I'm, I'm working with those characters right now and um i have no idea when it'll be finished but uh, there will be another story with the characters from law um where are my favorite places to visit and do i travel off the beaten path very often um i have and i haven't um often is a different is, is a different thing um I tend to, I didn't get to travel much when I was young because I was poor and I did, well, I, I just wasn't of a mindset that you take a backpack and go around Europe, which some people bless their hearts, but I, I wasn't that person. I was raised with this Calvinist upbringing where it's like, so you're seven, do you have a job yet? Um, so I didn't do that sort of gap year thing that, uh, that a lot of people do. So I have traveled sort of in comfort later in life. Off the beaten path, I lived in Micronesia for like a month with some natives on a very small atoll. I wasn't there the whole month, but um, that was pretty off the beaten path. I was on the, uh, a little island called Mog Mog um, with the high chief of that area. And the highest level of technology was a thermos. So that was that was kind of off the beaten path. And I did, do not want to go back. It was a singular experience. It was awesome, but it was very uncomfortable. Um, I lived on the Crow Reservation for a month when I was researching Coyote Blue. Most of the time, if I've done, if I'm doing something that's outside of my comfort zone, it's because I'm doing it for a book, and I'm doing it because it'll make me do it. Um, uh, as I as I've gotten older and and uh, like room service more, I I <laughs> set a book in Paris. I want to set a book in Vienna. Um, I've set a bunch of books in San Francisco where I moved uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and. Uh, uh, if, if there's any off the beaten path to travel I do, it's like going down some back alley in Chinatown and just seeing something that, that 
will look cool in a book. Um, or, and early on, I have to say, I mean, I'm from a, a small town in Ohio. Going to a city was terrifying to me. The first book I wrote, wrote sitting, uh, set in a city was Blood Sucking Fiends. And I went to San Francisco and checked into a motel and then just rode the buses and stuff. And I, I was mostly terrified the whole time I was there for that year. And, you know, and now I've lived in San Francisco for 12 years. Um, but at the time, it was like I had these horror stories. I grew up with these horror stories of things that happened to people in cities and, and so forth. So, so off the beaten path is whatever's not normal for you at the time. And, and I've been to exotic places and scuba dive shipwrecks and that sort of stuff and worked that into books. And, and I've just gone into neighborhoods in my own city that I'm uncomfortable in and, and gone, okay, this is weird or this is cool or you know, it's exciting. Uh, but I don't tend to, I, I have a friend, Stephen Past, Stephen Pastis, who, who does Pearls Before Swine, uh, the comic strip and, and uh, To Me Failure, a series of books. And Stefan, that's the only way he travels. He won't go, he doesn't want to go to Prague in, in the Czech Republic. He wants to go to some village, you know, uh, che Chechny Kremlov, where they have carp in the bathtub at Christmas time and stuff like that. And that's the only kind of places he goes. He goes off the beaten path. Um, I, I don't really have any desire to do that. What I, I mean, if there's an interest for a story, I will go. Um, but, but for the most part, in the last 10, 15 years, I've, I've pretty much traveled to places that you want to go. London, Paris, uh, Prague, Vienna, um, places like that. So, yes and no. With all the book bonding happening on social, do I have a few book re recommendations I can share? Um, gosh, I, when I when you think about that, I think about what would uh, engender a, an interesting discussion among a, a book group, and it's always something that that I think is more thoughtful than what I would read by choice. Um, last few years, I've discovered a writer named Jenny Alfil, uh, and it's I think O F F I L. And her first book, The Bureau of Speculation, is such a weird, she writes, she's a poet and writes novels in these really short stanzas where every stanza is like a whole scene. Um, and I, I think it's interesting from a craft point of view. So if you're, if you're a writer, you aspire to be a writer, you like poetry, or it, it, her books are really interesting in that respect. Um, and, and maybe I'm just, because I'm a writer, I'm looking for something that's different rather than something that's just a, a competent uh, novelist who, who's, uh, looking at stuff but um, uh, and as I mentioned before Mill Millington stuff is really interesting instructions for living someone else, else's life is, is interesting um, but I, I don't have that many recommendations but my book you should read my book um, because I need to pay for my house I'm watching the scroll here it's a beautiful book. will we ever see a continuation of Abby and Tommy's story I do not know um, those are, for, for the uninitiated, those are characters from my vampire books, which is uh, Blood Sucking Fiends, You Suck and Bite Me. And, um, uh, and Abby appears peripherally in uh, Secondhand Souls in one scene. But uh, I don't know if I'll revisit that. I mean, I don't, I'm not close to it. I just feel, I feel like I finished that. But... There are people who are interested in doing stuff with that in, in the entertainment industry, and, and if it goes, if that happens, then I would be happy to step in and say, well, this is what should happen next with them, or suggest it, or our help, or whatever. Um, but I, I, I like as as those of you who read my books, I, I like to leave. I like to write my books so it feels like you've stepped into someone's life, you've watched it happen for a while, you've gone through some adventures with them, and then life goes on afterwards. Um, and that's sort of what I feel about that. And then that's the challenge to your imagination, is you get to say, well, what would happen to Tommy and Abby after all those adventures in those three books? Um, I'm not closed to it, but I don't have a plan of, of continuing that story. If someone, and I feel that way about a number of the books, is that, like Coyote, Coyote Blue, I don't think I would ever write a sequel to that book, but if someone makes a television show of it, I would definitely help make new episodes that aren't in the book. Um, but I, I feel like I've done what I want to do in in most of the books. And if they haven't, then I'll, I'll write another one. Next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for joining me in the live with Christopher. So, 
about you know the sequel thing i i don't think i planned any of the sequels for any of my books except um i always knew i was going to do a second i hoped i was always going to do a second vampire book when i wrote blood Second Feet. and that book did so poorly um when it came out i think in 94 that i couldn't write a sequel to it i had to wait till 12 years until my uh career recovered enough that i could write a sequel to blood sucking things and, and it was it was a challenge because uh, the city had changed during the part that i wrote about the soma in san francisco which is where the main characters live in the first book it was like pakistani restaurants and transmission shops and artist foundries and stuff like that and when i went back to write Musak in in the early o's um it was uh, the internet had moved to the Soma, and it was like Twitter. And well, Twitter wasn't there yet, but, there, but a lot of the big internet companies that you know of, and, and a lot of them that are gone, like Pets.com and stuff, were in the Soma in San Francisco. And so that neighborhood had completely changed. And yet, I was going to have the book start the next day after the last one happened, which was very '90s. And you know, people were listening to Pearl Jam or in flannel and stuff like that. So I, uh, I actually went to a book group meeting um, with in a bookstore in San Francisco where they were reading. Uh, blood sucking themes, and I, I may have been living in Hawaii, and I phoned in on a conference call, and I asked everybody, "What am I going to do? How do you think? You know, what should I do with the fact that the city has completely changed during the intervention, the intervening time?" And everybody said, "Oh, just ignore it. Nobody will care." And I just ignored it. I just act like it was the next day, and I didn't address the fact that the tech world was in there, um, and so I just, uh, I just went forward with with it as if it was the next day, and didn't really mention that now everybody had. You know, cell phones and the internet was in the neighborhood instead of uh, empty industrial uh, spaces and, and artist lofts and so forth. So uh, sometimes you don't always have it planned, and you just have to roll with it. And uh, I, I think when I go on book tour, uh, I usually have left the book behind by that time because it's usually about a year to eighteen months from the time you turn it in to the time it comes out. And so I'm on to another project. And then when I go out and I hear everybody who's excited about the new book, especially as it gets toward the end of the tour, people have read it, I'll uh, I'll go, oh yeah, that is exciting. And then I'll come up with an idea. Well, maybe I should write another one because people seem to really like that one. And that's the thing that's weird about being a humorist. Now I have a couple of friends who are stand-up comedians, and you work your material. You each night you do sort of your standard set, and you work in new stuff that you thought of that day. And if it works, that becomes part of the act, and you go forward, and everything gets tested and timed and fixed and polished and made better. And um, and that's a, a great way to go. But with if you're writing humor in a novel, you tell the joke, and 18 months later you find out if anybody laughed. So it's really hard to to sort of stay on your toes as far as uh, you have to trust what you think is funny, and and you don't have the feedback of the audience. But when I go out on book tour, is when I hear that reaction, and when I hear you readers say, "Oh, well, I like this, or I like that, or I'd like to see more of this, or I'd like to see more of that," which is actually helpful. It doesn't help me when if you go, I, I hate bats or something like, you know, some very specific piccadilla. Um, but, uh, but you know, if people, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's how I ended up with a, a fruit bat, a giant Micronesian fruit bat in California for Christmas. Um, it was because you guys asked for it. Um, so, so a lot of times when you're asking, will there be this or will there be that? Um, it, it's less about whether I like writing it or whether I feel the story calls for it, and more about what my feedback has been. Um, with the exception of Lamb, who everybody says, oh, you should do a, a sequel to Lamb, and I say, no, I shouldn't. Um, although, I don't know, if I was really like living in a box and starving, I'd like, sure, I'd do a sequel to Lamb. It's like Lamb 2, the Lamining or something. But uh, but as I, as I sit in comfort in, in my semi-tower here, I'm good. I don't need to do a sequel. Um, Rich is embarrassed to admit he has not read any of my books, which, which you read for, well, you're just going to do shitty on the test. Um, I'm sorry, man. Uh, pass fail. Uh, I don't know. Read, uh, a, a really good gateway book is, is The Stupidest Angel, because it's like five books that are all compacted into a Christmas story, and it's pretty short. So if you don't like that, you're not going to like the rest of them. Uh, my first book was Practical Demon Keeping. It's also fairly short, so it and it and it doesn't really do all the stuff that I will be able to do as I figure out what I'm doing, but it kind of has that element. Um, 
A Dirty Job is a really good gateway book if you want to read something set in modern times, and Lamb is probably a really good gateway book if you want to read something historical. Um, so, you know, that gives you four. I realize that wasn't the one. But if you're going to read one, I'm, I'm sure that the, if I could do a, a survey, I'm sure everybody would tell you Lamb. Um, but what I've been told a lot of times is that A Dirty Job is, is the best gateway book because it's it's sort of rich and it's set in the modern setting and it's it's got a, a fair amount of interesting characters and I think it's relatable. But uh, uh, any, any of those four would give you a sense of what I do and whether you're going to like what I do or not. Um, so get the one that your friend has and you don't have to pay for it. Kurt says, how long did it take me to get the shot of the squirrel from my book? Like no time at all. Squirrels are such sluts for, for uh, tree nuts, and, and I just, um, we have a squirrel feeder out there. Um, as I said, I, I was deeply influenced, so I just, uh, yesterday I got my first copy of the book, my first hard copy, which I, it's probably still out on the squirrel feeder, and, um, and I put it, uh, I put it out there and grabbed my camera, and I put, it, you know, nothing happened for a minute, so I put like four English walnuts out there, and then there was squirrels wrestling in front of the book. So, so really, it took almost no time at all, um, and I have this little, uh, what is it? it's a little Sony uh, A5 or A6000 or something like that, and it's, it's ridiculously fast, so it shoots like 11 frames a second, so so the, what looked like impeccable timing was just the fact that I'm using this machine gun camera that will pick up, you know, 11 frames a second, and that was how I got that shot, so not, not long, um, but, uh, you know. They're tame squirrels too, but total, total uh, nut horse. Is that it? Are we wrapping up? Thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you like the new book, Shakespeare for Squirrels. They, they'll fix that in post. I'll be holding that book. And um, um, I've kind of enjoyed talking to myself in my guest bedroom. I hope. You